the panel, the discussion, an objective and impartial view of the issues of interest to you. Nation Beat is on now. Welcome to a production of the Ministry of Health in collaboration with the National Television Network and the Government Information Service on, in the observation of World Diabetes Day. I am your presenter today, Sant Justin. We will be discussing World Diabetes Day 2022, uh, annually, annually celebrated on November 14th. This year's theme, Diabetes Education to Protect Tomorrow. Very specific theme and with me I have a, a panel from the Ministry of Health and the SLDHA, who is going to help me talk about that theme. But we don't want to make it a straightforward discussion. It's gonna be very informative, very light, and the representative from the SLDHA is gonna take us on a journey. So just to introduce our panel today, uh, Dr. Shana Sir is the Senior Medical Officer with responsibility for chronic diseases with the Ministry of Health. Dr. Sir, just give us a little wave. Nurse Yolanda Alcindor, also from the Ministry of Health, is the Principal Nursing Officer. How are you doing today, Nurse? I'm good, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. And Mrs. Jacqueline Scott, a very special panel uh, member today. She's a board member of the St. Lucia Diabetes Hyper, uh, Hypertension Association, and she's also uh, living with the diabetes. So very interested to hearing your story today okay so just to kick off conversation um, recently uh, there was a survey held steps survey and it was uh, in its second phase okay the prelim preliminary results um, uh, came out with some concerns um, with our risk for chronic illness, diabetes included. Um, Dr. Sir, we wanna start the conversation with you. Can you share with us a little on the current situation in country with diabetes, particularly in reference to the STEPS survey? Okay, um, we're very happy. I'm very happy to be here this morning. Very, very good question. Um, so in 2019, and 2020, we embarked upon something called our Behavioral Risk Factor Survey, um, which is called STEPS, uh, a stepwise approach actually. And we looked at the risk factors for chronic diseases, including diabetes, but not limited to diabetes. So we looked at things like what the diets were like, whether people were exercising, smoking, alcohol consumption, we also measured persons. We looked at what their waist circumference was, what the, the weight was, blood pressures, we looked at blood sugars, cholesterol levels, and so on. When the results came out um, last year, we took a while to get them, because um, they had to go through the external organizations and so on, who were helping us with the analysis. When the results came out, we were very concerned about particular things and and one of the things one of the, the risk factors for diabetes a very significant risk factor is obesity we realize that traditionally women are more obese than men in in the caribbean um, region particularly all of a sudden when we looked at our results from 2012 when we did that survey and looked at compared 2012 to 2019 the rate of obesity in men had risen by 20%. And that's significant, of course, when you look at the, the risk factors for diabetes, high blood pressure, cancers, et cetera. So, so that was concerning. The, um, the, the rate did not increase significantly for women, but for men who traditionally are, you know, have better weights, that, that had increased by, by 20%. For our blood pressure, our raised blood pressure, which is a significant risk factor for even diabetes itself, that had gone up by 12.1% between the years where we did the surveys. Our blood sugars had not changed that much, but um, the, we only measured blood sugars for about 30% of the respondents for the survey. Um, but like I said, obesity was one of those things. Physical activity, which is also a significant risk factor for diabetes, 
That was very concerning. Persons had not been engaging in physical activity for like moderate physical activity. We had about 80% of the respondents not doing that at all for the week. And of course that is concerning because it's a, a significant risk factor for, for diabetes and for NCDs. So on that same question, when you say concerning, um, would you say there was a significant downward trend coming from statistics before? Yes. Um, traditionally, probably around, you know, the, the, about half of the respondents would tell you, okay, they engage in, in physical activity. But for, for, um, for this particular round of survey, about 80% of them did not engage in any, um, you know, what we call moderate physical activity. We're talking about a little jogging, a little cycling, that kind of thing. People were not doing that. Okay, and our rate of sedentarism or physical inactivity was a lot higher than it usually is, and of course that's concerning. So from trends, trends seen through these two surveys, um, and from engagement with people within the clinical and community settings, what do you believe is underpinning the current trends with diabetes? The current trends in terms of just the survey, mm -hmm. we did, one of the concerns, um, we did a survey around the end of 2019 and into the beginning of 2020, mm -hmm. all right? Um, we can argue that persons were afraid of COVID, et cetera, they were probably not going out as much. Yeah, we can argue that, but remember, we did, we started the survey in 2019, okay? Um, one of the things we've noticed, not, not only with adults, but also with children, is the, the, the tendency to be um, using a lot of gadgets, um, spend a lot of time doing very sedentary things. You sit at work for eight hours. Mm -hmm. You go home, you sit in front of the TV, or, or you sit online, and you know, you're on social media and so on. So we know that that is definitely affecting our levels of physical activity. Okay, um, Ms. Alcindor, Principal Nursing Officer. Um, Senusha offers a very robust primary health care with um, health, health centers um, in communities island-wide. Uh, can you share a little on the services offered for diabetes prevention as well as treatment? Well, the services we offer through um, the Ministry of Health and Primary Care for diabetes on chronic disease this generally are uh, that um, we focus on prevention mm -hmm. and then we offer physical activity. There is screening so persons who are not diagnosed as yet can come in and get their blood pressure, their blood sugar tested. We do weight measurement, weight circumference, all that is part of our screening for chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. Also there is treatment available where um, persons who are living with chronic conditions, um, medical services are available, um, medications are available at the facilities. We offer support for our self-management program, which is a weekly um, program for two hours mm -hmm. for a duration of six weeks, where persons living with chronic conditions go through that program and they are, they are um, develop competence, different skills that they need to cope with their chronic condition. We look at problem solving, decision making, physical activity, healthy eating, all that is part of our chronic disease program. Also for both persons with diabetes and high blood pressure, we do offer eye care where we have our diabetic retinopathy program and all the services through primary health care is free of charge. It's at no cost and it's available to everyone. Mm -hmm. Now, with all these services available, um, the statistics coming from the steps of E, would you say it's surprising or how, how, how did you take it? Well, I won't say that it is surprising because there are other factors. Although the services are available, other factors contribute to um, persons self-management and healthy lifestyle practices. Like Dr. Sir mentioned before, we were just starting with COVID 
And also, there are changes within society where um, we have to encourage physical activity. Just the knowledge, the information is insufficient. We have to try to create safe spaces where persons can go out and engage in physical activity. And that is one of the areas we really have to focus on if we want to change the trend that we are seeing now. Okay. Um, we just want to change up a little bit and um, bring in uh, Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott, you're here in a dual capacity. Mm -hmm. So first, we want to talk to you as a board member of the Senosha Diabetes and Hypertension Association. Mm -hmm. um, as Anna, someone who's living with diabetes, can you start by sharing with us your journey with the diabetes mm -hmm. diagnosis? How has it been for you? Well, I would say so far, so far so good. Um, but I'm quite aware that I ought not to take it for granted. Um, my journey with diabetes began with my mom having been diagnosed with diabetes some time prior. And so we got to see her live with it. And I must say kudos to her. She really handled it well. I mean, from the word go, she did everything she was supposed to have done. Um, so she managed her diabetes well, but I can say that we also have it throughout our family on both sides. Mm -hmm. My dad has it as well, well very well managed, um, but I got to see my grandmother have it, um, or my aunts having it, and we've lost loved ones through diabetes. So I was always at high risk of developing it. And um, so I had, being aware of that, Every time I did go to see the doctor for my checkups and so on, of course I got my test done, my urine test and so on. Um, and I thought, well, everything always came on. Okay. So I thought that I was all right. I, did, I, I didn't pursue, I didn't study and research more information about it. I just thought if your sugars are okay, then you're all right. Until one day I went to one of my doctors on another matter um, that was recurring. And she said, have you been tested for diabetes? And what's the, um, do you have diabetes in your family? And since I did, she told me there is, I, when, I, when I explained to her, well, I mean, I've always been, you know, taking my tests and so on, and everything's coming out okay. And she said, there's another test. I will send you for that one. And that I did, only to find that the results showed that I had blown all five parameters of the chart. My, I had full-blown diabetes. And um, apparently I'd had it for a while. And so that's where the journey began. And I can say that it still didn't quite hit me. So at the, at the start, it, it, it was a lot just to know, oh my goodness, I did get the thing, <laughs> right? But I was still in denial because I, there were not many changes to my body. You know, I wasn't feeling sick and all of that, you know? So I think I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'll not get it back, okay? Until I started seeing those changes because now I was more aware. So one of the things I found was that I started having fuzzy brain um, I just found out I was um, finding myself slow to respond to questions and just wondering, well, what's going on with me? It's like, I used to be able to think quicker than that, but what's happening? And um, also, when I started feeling weak, and one of those, on one occasion, I wrecked my car in the mall, in the parking lot, and I hit a pillar, I ripped the side of the car. And I just wondered, well, how did that happen? Because in my mind, there was no pillar there, you know? And the pillar just came in the way. And what happened was that my sugar was really low. And I was getting to a dangerous place at that time. And I wasn't even aware that this, this, this is what happened. This is what diabetes does when your sugar is low. 
So I, I was disoriented um, in a really bad way at that time, and I wasn't aware. And that is where I got to discover this is what diabetes is like, this is what it does, um, this is how serious it is, and you could have really gone down in a bad place at that point. So that is when I began to pay attention to it and start being more aware of the changes in my body. When I ate certain things, how my body changed, how I felt, and then it became real to me. And I began to learn more, research more, and start to do the things that I needed to do. It became a reality then. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Dr. Sir, um, if somebody has gone through the whole process, um, the test, well, as far as they're concerned, and then to end up in a position where um, the doctor is saying, yes, you have diabetes, after you know you've gone through that process, um, how is that possible? Um, so, for diabetes, we do screening, uh -huh. and we recommend screening for particular individuals uh -huh. um, when it comes to the risk factors for diabetes. So we have things like your age, all right, above 45, whether or not your family has a history of diabetes, which uh, Ms. Scott alluded to, um, whether you're obese, that's, that's a significant risk factor. Our, our ethnicity, okay, black people are more prone to having, you know, diabetes, whether or not you're somebody who actually exercises, because physical activity would help you with that. Um, whether or not you've had gestational diabetes, some women have diabetes during pregnancy, later on they can become full-blown diabetic so we, we recommend screening for persons like that and the, the screening would have to be at intervals we recommend that at least once every three years you get your screening done we do um, a finger stick right um, with a glucometer however if that reading is abnormal once you hit above a hundred on a hundred milligrams per deciliter we would start looking at you as possibly having what we call prediabetes. We would send you for another test, which would be our fasting blood sugar or our HbA1c, or we do an oral glucose tolerance test if we have reason to believe that you need that too, okay? So, so traditionally, before we tested people's urine for diabetes, however, the research has shown that urine that Blood, uh, sugar would end up in urine after the blood sugar is pretty high, okay? And so you'd, be that, you'd probably be diabetic and not be spilling sugar until you reach a particular level. So that we don't use for diagnosis or screening anymore. We do blood, okay? So we have to get your blood either from your finger initially to give us, you know, something to go by, but then we would get blood from your, your vein and actually test that to see whether or not you have reached a particular level where we can consider you diabetic or pre-diabetic. And that blood test must be done at a lab. Yeah, yes. yes. Okay. So should we stop calling it PISADU then? <laughs> I, honestly, we call it PISADU, but we need to be very careful about calling it PISADU mm -hmm. because long before your urine becomes mm -hmm. sweet, if you want to say it that, say it like that, you can already become diabetic, be diabetic because the, the blood sugars are higher than they should be. Okay. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, um, Mr. Scott, you mentioned something very significant, which is changes in your body. Um, I mean, that's something that we don't take note of mm -hmm. as individuals, changes, changes in our body. And women normally do it. They would run to the doctor as soon as they see the slightest change. But I guess men take a little longer. So can we talk about noticing changes in your, in your body and maybe when you should, um, let's say, run <laughs> to the doctor? Well, like Dr. Sears said that um, screening is done. You do not have to wait for changes to get screened, to get tested. However, if you're experiencing any change, you should seek medical attention as soon as possible. The health centers are accessible and it, you do not need money. It, um, the services are available. We we'll provide counseling at the wellness centers and we will direct you 
to where you can get the services and get it in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. So we're asking persons, do not wait for change. If you have not been screened for a while, come to go to your nearest wellness center to be screened. Also, persons who are already living with the chronic condition, if you do observe changes, you notice changes, also visit so that we could do further tests because that's a possibility you are developing complications from your chronic condition. Mm -hmm. Now, as a nurse practitioner, uh, what is your view on how the services are being utilized, both clinical services and education programs um, offered on diabetes? Well, we would love for more persons to access the service. We would love for more persons to come in because our wellness centers are open from 8 to 4.30. Um, what we find in our culture, a lot of persons come in the morning and the afternoon can be quiet. So we're asking persons, you can call, you can make an appointment, you can walk in to access our services. Um, I want to ask you, Mr. Scott, um, almost a similar question. Mm -hmm. In your role with the SLDHA, uh, what would you like to see uh, change as it pertains to current trends with diabetes and cell mm -hmm. Well, one of the things we will be pushing um, next year in our educational campaign is the need for individuals to seriously consider developing a healthier lifestyle. I mean, off the bat. Um, so once you have that in mind, apart from the screening, having to, you know, always do your checkups and make sure everything is okay. But if we com commence um, living healthier lifestyles in terms of our eating, our exercising, drinking more water and things like that, and we'd like to encourage people to start doing it from young, mm -hmm. right? That's why f on we have gone to our alma maters to speak to the young ones, we decided to start there, to start passing on the message that you can start even from now, you can start making the right decisions from now in terms of what it is you eat, um, how, you, how much water you drink, in terms of you know, getting all the gadgets, the devices, the gamers, the games and so on, and engaging in, in playful activities where you are um, being a little more physical and so on. Get, get out of the house, I encourage them to, you know, be happy about doing their chores because all, every bit of movement that you give to your body is part of exercise. So just start it, just incorporating it throughout your life and, and how we eat and so on. So that's one of the things we will be pushing. Let's begin there, like taking care of our body because our bodies are wired a certain way. It's meant to function a certain way. It's meant to absorb nutrients a certain way, process your foods a certain way. The, there's a purpose for the water and the quantity of water you drink per day. And um, Dr. Sear referred to living a sedentary lifestyle. I can say that I was guilty of that. Office workers, you spend those hours at your desk per day. Maybe a bit of movement here, if you have to go out for lunch, move about the building or wherever it is. But when you think of the number of hours that are spent at your desk per day, you leave late at the end of the day, there's no time to go out to the gym or to go walking because it gets dark now, especially for a woman. So it has been those issues about feeling safe on the road, you know, and, and you know, I'll get to exercise, you start the gyms and then there, you know, you think of the course, can I really sustain that? You know, and then you just put it off. But then that body is not getting the, the amount of physical exercise it needs to help with the food and the drinking of water and so on. So. If there's anything apart from the services, because we're looking to introduce more programs mm -hmm. as um, the theme for the next few years is access to diabetes care. So apart from the care, we want to help educate people and encourage and inspire people to live healthier lifestyles. So as Ministry of Health, we have thought of that. And part of primary care is that we do outreach. We go out to the communities to the workplace where persons who do not readily access the services at the wellness center, we bring the services to them. Also, we have nutritional counseling that's available. And um, for our Caribbean Wellness Day, we launched St. Lucia Move, encouraging persons to move, engage in physical activity. And we're hoping that the workplaces will come on board and have everybody 
moving and um, getting physically active. Mm -hmm. um, I want to zoom in a little bit on your journey mm -hmm. because there are people at home mm -hmm. um, who probably went through the same thing that you went through. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe they tried, but they didn't know, mm -hmm. like you did. Mm -hmm. um, tell, us, tell us about some of the changes um, mm -hmm. that you had to make mm -hmm. after you were diagnosed. Well, one, I had to go on a diet immediately, <laughs> lose a few pounds. Mm -hmm. My doctor was on my case. I got my diet sheets and so on. Yes, and I, so we did that um, to manage the weight, um, the getting into more physical activity. So even if I'm not on the road, mm -hmm. just making sure that I'm always moving and getting out of the house, running errands and doing so on. Um, I've also had to start reading my labels cut on sugar, um, change the types of sugar that I use, if I use at all. So getting accustomed to drinking your tea without sugar, reducing on milk or changing your milk to healthier plant-based milks and so on. Um, reading labels has been big for me. So now I'm aware of reading, checking my carbs, how much sugar, and also even fruit, knowing which fruits are better. Because even if the, the sugar in fruit are healthier, mm -hmm. they are those that have more. So they are those that are better. So I choose that more tart fruits and so on. Um, so I do a lot of research. I read up on, on meal, how to combine my foods, what time to eat, um, how just, just being on top of it, time of day to eat, mm -hmm. um, getting my rest, sufficient rest that I'm still working on. Um, but these are some of the changes, as well as um, constantly checking my sugar, making sure that I check several times a day. So I'm getting used to getting my little pricks and so on. I have to get my, my devices, make sure I have my strips and so on. So you just have to be on top of it and um, be aware, be more conscious of your body, the changes. Because you're moving about and you feel, you feel weak, but you just think, I'm not feeling well today, or I'm tired, you know or I'm just hungry. The reason why I'm feeling is I'm, I'm just hungry. But you don't know that your sugar is plummeting so low, you, you could be in a dangerous place. So you're not just hungry. You're moving into a place where you can find yourself in a coma, collapse or something. So being more aware of the changes to my body now and knowing how to interpret that, and um, that's where I'm at so far. I think the scary thing, um, about knowing mm -hmm. that you're living with diabetes is how the changes that mm -hmm. you have to make would affect you. Mm -hmm. How has these changes, uh, how has the effect of these changes mm -hmm. been for you? Well, I mean, I suppose we are creatures of habit and you don't like restrictions and you've always been accustomed to being able to eat what you want to eat, do what you want to do. If I feel tired now, I will rest. Um, so the fact that you have to change your life as a whole and things you thought were okay because you think, well, I don't eat bad. I'm not a junk food person. Mm -hmm. You know, like people would eat a, a whole chocolate bar, you know, I used to go crazy over ice cream and this and that and the other. Um, although I, I do need to mention, I am a cake decorator, baker, so I do sweet stuff. Um, but to say that I consume so much of it or whatever, so I thought I was okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but you have to rethink all of those things and just know that if you are having it, you don't indulge. I wouldn't say that I indulge, but the fact that I have the disease, I know that I have to be all the more careful and, and just know how, what proportion to use. And if you choose to indulge now, know what else to do well for your next meal, what not to take, you know, so that you don't add to that. So it's just a matter of getting the information, mm -hmm. understanding the disease, understanding how it affects the body, and applying that knowledge on a daily basis. So that you said some very interesting things. We're going to tag zoning more on those things when we get back. This is Take 30. We'll be back in a few. Let me tell you how I'm looking. God made man. Man made money. She's so fine, man. She's a vibe. God made woman to eat my money. Yo, all side. Team Bograd.
any vet we go, we see gets what to. Okay, thank you for staying with us on Take 30. Today we are talking diabetes, World Diabetes Day, celebrated on uh, November 14th, and we're still um, talking about, we're still trying to educate the masses on diabetes. Dr. Sir, during the break, um, you said you wanted to expound more on changes in the body. You're saying that sometimes there are no changes. So sometimes, most times, initially, even if you are diabetic and you're not screening, you're not checking your blood sugars, etc., mm -hmm. the changes may be so subtle that you do not pick them up. So you think you're okay, but you're actually not okay. The, the damage is being done in your body. Remember, our, there's only a particular level of blood sugar that should exist within the body for it to, run, to function normally. If your body's running on a, a higher than normal blood sugar, every part of your body's being affected, in essence, because the blood flows through every part of your body. So we just want to make sure that the average solution or the average viewer understands that even that that even if you don't feel anything, at least so you think that there could be changes happening, you can be diabetic, especially if you have a few risk factors. Mm -hmm. So screening is really important. Okay, you go and you check. Um, relatives have diabetes. Um, my mother has diabetes. My sister, etc. Go check routinely. It does not, I mean, it doesn't hurt in the end, okay? That, that is what I wanted to say specifically. So you're saying even with no reason, just pick up... Your reason is testing. that you have risk factors for diabetes, mm -hmm. all right? We're talking about obesity, um, family history of diabetes. You've had a, a very big baby, um, more than nine pounds. As a woman, you've had a baby more than nine pounds. You are at risk for diabetes. You're a smoker. Smoking is a significant risk factor for diabetes. You have high blood pressure. High blood pressure can cause you to get diabetes. So once you're hypertensive, you should be checking for diabetes as well. All right, so we're saying don't just determine that, oh, well, I don't feel anything. I'm good. I don't have diabetes. No, that's not the way to go. Go exactly. screen for diabetes. So and minus minus all these factors. Minus all these regular, factors. You're 40, you're 40 years old, 45. Mm -hmm. Routinely do your screening. Yeah, mm -hmm. and screening are available at all the wellness centers, mm -hmm. so you can access that service closest to you mm -hmm. at your wellness center. And um, if at the time when you do the glucose test, the finger prick, if it's if it's elevated, then you'll be given a form to go to a lab to do another test. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Mr. Scott said something. Um, a little earlier about um, uh, she's a, a baker, you're a baker. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, um, I'm not too sure if it's a myth, but a regular conversation would say, you know, cakes are not good. Don't eat cakes, don't eat anything with, um, I don't want to say too much sugar, but a certain amount of sugar. Um, let me ask you first, Mr. Scott. How is your relationship with your doctor? <laughs> you being a baker. Uh, well, she's on top of it. I'm, we have a, we discuss it thoroughly. Mm -hmm. She spends time with me, mm -hmm. so we go through um, how much I consume mm -hmm. and how I consume. If I do consume, how to manage it thereafter, mm -hmm. in terms of what do I eat next, so that I don't you know, exacerbate it and so on. The fact is, I am in it daily. Mm -hmm. I, I, everything I do is, includes sugar and so on. So um, it's just a matter of managing it, mm -hmm. if that's the business I'm in, mm -hmm. um, being aware of my risk and um, taking care of myself in the process. Mm -hmm. So the fact that um, Mr. Scott is a baker, um, does this change anything? Um, I mean, People will say, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat. Mm -hmm. um, well, does we does do moderation not... come in here? Is, is moderation? Yes, moderation is um, important, um, self-discipline, moderation, and also education on portion. 
So portion size, what amount you're going to have and what it contains. As uh, Mr. Scott mentioned earlier, she spoke about label reading. Mm -hmm. And all that is part in, of our self-management program that's available. So we need to know somebody living with, and not only persons living with diabetes, but generally, if you're going to consume any food high in sugar or um, refined um, flour and so on, that it should be in moderation. And also you need to substitute because of the conversion after you've consumed that food, that amount of sugar that will be in the blood, in the blood at the time, you need to know what you're going to consume next. So you'll eat less of anything that contains carbohydrates, starch, you'll consume more water so your body can get rid of it faster, so you do not develop, you know, causes any damage. Or um, it's not something that, that should be done on a regular basis that you'll have elevated sugars to move on to complications. Mm -hmm. So moderation, small amount, and a balancing act. You've had something that is considered not too healthy, then you need to consume more healthier foods. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to... self-monitoring, um, not cutting you short, Dr. Sim. Self-monitoring is very important at this point also. So I've consumed a, a slice of cake, I need to check what my sugar is for the next meal. Even before the next meal, I need to find out what it is so I know what I can consume for mm -hmm. that next meal. Mm -hmm. And yeah. persons living with diabetes need yeah. to be empowered on how to test their blood sugar yes. on their own, have their meters, and so on. Correct. We encourage that, Correct. although it's not everyone who can afford it. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping within the health system we'll be able to give some support very soon to persons living with especially diabetes and high blood pressure for self-monitoring. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the okay. self-monitoring, self um, can you tell us uh, what you do to um, monitor yes. your... Well, one of the things I try to do is ensure that I have something in my stomach before, <clears throat> before I consume cake or cookies or something. Mm -hmm. So try to have proteins or fiber in my stomach so that it helps, it slows down the absorption of the sugar mm -hmm. in my system. And also, as she said, after you've had that, just observe your body mm -hmm. after you've had it, know how much to have in the first place, mm -hmm. and also observe the body to see if there are any changes, how you feel, and know what not to eat. So I'll not have another sweet thing in a hurry after I've had a slice of cake, and before my next meal, just be sure that my sugars are in the right place. As a whole, you just want to check your sugars. Know that your sugars are okay before you um, consume anything. I try to do that. Get my device, check my sugars, see if I'm okay. And um, because, because I have the diabetes and I need to be sure that I manage it properly, that is my routine. And it's, it's something else that's very oh, important when it comes to control is taking your medication mm -hmm. in a yes. timely manner and as prescribed. Mm -hmm. So if you're experiencing any difficulties, any challenges with the medication, you should go back to your doctor, come to the wellness center because the medication can be adjusted and also we can um, give you advice on how best to take the medication mm -hmm. to prevent complications. Mm -hmm. So we do have a challenge where persons do not want to take the medication. They skip days or they cut on the dosage and so on. Mm -hmm. This is not advisable. Especially considering, um, you know what Ms. Asando is saying about the medication. Um, persons, you know, when we look at the myths concerning diabetes, uh, you know, in, in, in the wellness centers, patients have come to me and said, well, you know, your D money piece I do. They say I have diabetes yeah. but is so and so who did me something okay I don't have diabetes okay it can uh, there can be denial but then because they don't think that they have diabetes then they tell you they're not taking the drugs I've had patients say but doc the drugs are supposedly gonna destroy my kidneys they're gonna make me sicker they're gonna do this and that but when you look at the 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 effects of not taking the drugs to control your blood sugar. Blood sugar that is left uncontrolled damages every single part of the body, all right? 
we, we and of course we have um, our, the co complications that we know you know you 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 lose your eyesight you know you can lose your eyesight you could have strokes you know you can have heart issues you could have kidney problems we have quite a bit of problems as a, a healthcare system because of our um, prevalence of diabetes we almost at 12 percent as a country you know and of course the the kidney pathologies and people needing dialysis that is something that a country can't afford but that is diabetes so in a, in in as much as they're probably not feeling that sick and they see a need not to take the meds the complications are coming on and as the complications come on then they're in a worse state than they would have been yeah. if they had taken the medication as prescribed yeah. Okay, and as Nurse Asendor said, if there's an issue, if you're concerned, you come back and sit with the healthcare provider and discuss the issue. And one of the complications we must not forget is the feet, yes. where persons are losing their toes, persons are having amputation, losing their feet, and so on. This um, creates a lot of problems because people are unable to move around as they would like. You have mm -hmm. lots of income you have a burden for other family members to support and all this can be prevented or even delayed if we start managing well prevention first and start managing effectively as soon as we are diagnosed and the self-management program provides that education and support for persons living with chronic condition mm -hmm. um, i want to talk more about the um, education aspect of managing uh, diabetes and what's what's been happening um, within the, the last month in observance of um, World Diabetes Day. Um, you mentioned some of the things that were being done. Um, let's, let's go a little further into uh, what is being done during the month of November. Um, Mr. Scott mentioned labeling and I know that's something that, that was being uh, taught during yeah, that process. So um, it's not only during the month of November, but throughout the year, as the year goes by, we provide education and support. And one of the ways that is done is through the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. And like I said before, this program is over a duration of six weeks. Okay. We meet once a week for two and a half hours. And every session, we look at different areas and topics where we give persons skills so they can manage effectively. Because someone living with chronic condition, they only see the healthcare provider maybe once every three months. And during that period of time, they have to manage. And whether they do a good job, they do a bad job, that's their form of management. We'd love everybody to manage good manage well to avoid complications. So one of the good thing about the self-management program is that at every session we do what we call action plan. Each individual within the group, just having the group form, is a form of support for each other. And for the action plan, at the, towards the end of our session, individuals decide on something that they want to do for themselves before we meet the, the following week and to be able to do it effectively. So they can decide on anything or something we've discussed within that session. Our sessions, like I said before, communication. How we talk to ourselves, the thoughts that we have, how we talk with our healthcare provider, problem solving when challenges come about, how we solve problems, or how we have to learn to live with something that we cannot solve, but we can manage. And all that is part of stress management also. Um, we look at healthy eating, weight control, how we make decisions, how we decide whether we'll try a new medication, or whether we'll continue our medication, and label reading also is part of that program. The program is designed in a way that everyone can benefit, even if you're not fully literate, you can't read and write, you can still benefit through the program. Label reading is very effective because it, we are able to know what we're taking in. When we go to the supermarket, we consume or we purchase foods, we're able to look at what amount of salt, 
sugar and other nutrients this food contains. Sometimes we'll be surprised that foods we never thought contain salt has high level of salt and also sugar. And that is why a Ministry of Health is also working on to um, front label, yes, where for persons who are unable to read the small print, they can just look at the label and see the signs and know whether this is high in salt, is this is high in sugar, is that a food I want to consume. Okay. I think there was a point in time, at least maybe when I was a bit younger, where <laughs> you would think that um, high, um, hypertension and even diabetes um, only affected a certain age range. Is that a myth? Oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Like I was saying, one of the most significant risk factors for things like diabetes, even hypertension, is obesity. And the world is becoming very obese. Okay, the world over, St. Lucia is no exception. The Caribbean region, actually, even in our child, childhood population, we have a serious issue with obesity. So when you're looking at obesity being a risk factor for our children, mm -hmm. right? We're looking at type 2 diabetes, which is the more predominant kind of diabetes, okay? There are a few kinds of diabetes, but when generally we're only talking about diabetes in our setting. We're talking about type 2 diabetes, which is more, you know, lifestyle, you know, related. We're looking at, we're seeing in our region and in the world over that younger persons are getting type 2 diabetes. Traditionally, children didn't get type 2 diabetes and, and we're looking up to 18 all right when i say children mm -hmm. they did not get type 2 diabetes so once a child would have had diabetes you were almost sure back in the day that it was the type 1 which you know couldn't be helped right, right now you have younger persons 12 13 getting type 2 diabetes and this all is right? the one that you can prevent exactly later on yeah okay. all right mm -hmm. so it is an issue it is an issue that that it's no longer a myth that, oh, okay, well, you know what? Um, I'm 25, I can't be diabetic because I'm still young. No, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. We're having younger and younger persons becoming diabetic. Yeah. Like, now, you said, you said the word. I want you to be specific. In St. Lucia, do we have persons 18 and below? We do. Who are, who are type 2 diabetics, okay? We have type 1 diabetics who are children, but we have type 2 diabetics who are 18 and below, yes. Okay. We do. Um, Mr. Scott, you wanted to oh, Yeah, interject? I just wanted to say that I'm also a member of the Diabetes Foundation for Youth, mm -hmm. which is a youth chapter of the SLDHA, mm -hmm. and it's a support group for young people, mm -hmm. youth with diabetes. And um, we have young children, 5, 6, 7, 8, teens who are living with diabetes and um, th it's a useful group to be in because you know there's support moral support we check on each other you know what are your sugars this morning and if somebody isn't doing too well we put pressure on you and so on and uh, there are other services available for the youth so that's something I'd like the public to be aware of that they could look into um, but I would like to mention that we have a member, he's 22 now, but he's been diagnosed for a few years, who unfortunately just lost his second leg. So he's now a double amputee, wow. and he's only 22 years old. So it really goes to show that that is possible, um, that young people can have it, and have it in a chronic way. And that is why we would like for young people to be aware of that disease so that from now they can start making the changes to their lives. That's what the di diabetes so that can be prevented. If you start early, you can help delay the onset or avoid getting it at all. Not all of those in our group have the type two, but it just shows you that, that it's just as real and that you have young people having amputations, unfortunately. Wow, that's interesting. Now, as we close off, um, Dr. Sir, from your professional view, what do you think is the most urgent need to reduce the impact of diabetes on our population? Um, I, I want to just go back to what we're saying, what we've been saying throughout the program. Mm -hmm. I think education is really, really key. And we, we're not looking at education just for the person of diabetes. We're looking at education of the general population 
education as to what diabetes is, <coughs> is mm. what diabetes is, and what it can do and how it can be managed. Also, education of our healthcare providers. Sometimes I think we don't take diabetes seriously, all right? And mm -hmm. I think it should be taken so much more seriously than it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And of course, education of our patient population. Um, diabetes needs to be the kind of thing that is spoken of in, in, in a very simple language so persons understand what it is, what's going on in their bodies, right, and what they do about it. Like Ms. Asinder was saying, most of the diabetes management and any chronic disease management happens outside of the, health, um, the, the, the healthcare provider's office. So persons need to know about the disease, what to do about it and how to manage. They, and, and Nurse Hassender was saying something, we need to be empowered, we need, we need an enabling environment to, to manage a disease. If you can't even have a sidewalk to walk and physical activity is so important when it comes to managing diabetes, all right? Um, weight loss, things like that, those things need to, there needs to be an enabling environment to, to, to allow for those things to yes. happen. Closing statements? Diabetes is not a death sentence. Together, we can fight diabetes. Short and sweet. Um, nurse Alcindor. Well, I would like to encourage persons to access the services that's available. Um, visit the wellness center closest to you. You can get screened, and also you can get information on the other services available to help you with prevention, if you're already diagnosed, to help you manage your chronic condition and we are there to serve you so feel free to come visit your wellness center closest to you mr scott in your closing statements um i would like to i would like you to reach out to persons who maybe have uh, or have been diagnosed with, di with diabetes mm -hmm. and probably sitting at home down and out any support groups that they can come to or just highlight that for us okay well, I would like to mention the services that are offered by the SLEHA as well, the St. Lucia Diabetes and Hypertension Association. You can walk in any time to our office. We for offer screenings as well. You can get your, te your, your glucometers, your strips. We offer counseling, and um, we can advise you on portion sizes. We sit with you, discuss, we check all your, your, your vitals. Vitals. And um, we also offer food care. Um, we have the equipment, everything, so you could get the full um, yeah. foot exams. Foot exams. <laughs> okay, so the St. Lucia Diabetes Association is there for you, and you will get the support from us. Feel free to walk in any time. Also, the Diabetes Foundation for Youth has activities coming up as well. We like to encourage the young people to be aware of that um, association and to inquire. You can call the St. Lucia Diabetes Office um, for information as to how you can join. Um, so there is support for members and uh, non-members as well mm -hmm. because we don't only have those who are living with it physically but family members and so on who are supporting those living with diabetes mm -hmm. so they can get counseling and help us or guidance mm -hmm. from us as well. And um, just to let you know that there is support also at your wellness center. Wellness Feel centers. free to register for the chronic disease self-management program. Um, registration can be done at all the wellness centers. You'll be once you register, you'll be contacted to participate in the next available group. All right. Thank you very much, okay. panel, for joining me on TV30. Uh, for this discussion on um, diabetes. November 14 was World Diabetes Day. Uh, November is not done yet, so we're still continuing with the education process. Um, this has been a production of the Ministry of Health uh, with, in, in collaboration with the National Television Network and the Government Information Service in observation of World Diabetes Day. I am your host, Sant. Just join us right here next time.